Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. May they be in keeping with your will and the teachings of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You know, you can't always trust your GPS. Harland Earls learned that the hard way this month when he was stranded for a week in the snowy wilderness of California's Sierra Nevada mountain range. He was on his way to a birthday party when a snowstorm shut down Interstate 80, prompting his GPS to suggest an alternative route, which happened to take him along Hennis Pass Road, an unplowed mountain pass. His truck became hopelessly mired in the snow before being buried by another blizzard that passed over just a little while later. Now to make matters worse, while he was trying to dig the truck out, his cell phone fell in the snow and got wet and wouldn't turn on. Now fortunately for Earls, he had come prepared. He had a camp stove in the back of his truck, which he used to melt snow that he drank out of a little metal doggy dish According to the news reports, he subsisted on this water along with a few cans of beans and some sausages. Now, I don't know if he was bringing those to the birthday party or if he always keeps a couple pounds of sausage in the back of his truck, but they certainly came in handy. Oh, and apparently he also had a box of dried spaghetti for some reason, which he emptied into a large Ziploc bag along with his waterlogged cell phone and some hand warmers and three days later, it had apparently absorbed enough moisture from the phone for it to start working again. But he still couldn't get a signal out there, so he strapped two snowboards to his feet and hiked his way up the nearest hill where he was finally able to call for help. As I read this story, I was amazed. I mean, just how much stuff does this guy keep in his truck? A camp stove, sure. Some propane, yeah, a snowboard, maybe, but two snowboards? A doggy dish? Sausages? Ziploc bags? A box of spaghetti? I measure my own chances of survival if I were to find myself in the same situation. And I did a quick inventory of everything I have in my car. It amounted to a plastic snow scraper, some old McDonald's french fries beneath my kid's booster seats, and a life-size dummy named Fred who I purchased for use in the, you know, weekly videos that I make for the church. Now, if you're wondering why I keep a life-size dummy in my car, I've got two words for you. Commuter lane. Anyway, I don't think I'd fare especially well in the wilderness. My car is not so well stocked as Harland Earl's truck. I haven't got a checklist of supplies or survival gear but I do frequently take stock of myself, and I try to keep an accurate inventory of what's stashed away in my heart. Many centuries ago, in the year 1517, a young nobleman named Ignatius of Loyola joined the Spanish army. This was an era of black powder and acrid smoke on the battlefield when firearms were wildly inaccurate, and while defending the city of Pamplona from the French, a cannonball passed right between Ignatius' legs. And he was lucky to survive the blast, which mostly missed him, but it did shatter one of his legs as it was passing by. Ignatius was dragged back to Loyola, where he rested and recuperated for several months until his wounds healed. And while he was convalescing, he saw a vision of Jesus and repented of all of his sins, which, having been a young, carousing nobleman, were plentiful. He came to believe that God saw something in him that he couldn't recognize in himself. A thick and shapeless trunk, he later wrote. A thick and shapeless trunk would never believe that it could become a statue admired as a miracle of sculpture, and would never consent to submit itself to the chisel of the sculptor who sees by his genius 
what he can make of it. Believing that God could see something beautiful in him, Ignatius devoted his life to his faith. He became a monk and later the founder of the Jesuit order. One of his lasting contributions remains his work in spiritual practices, specifically the so-called Ignatian Examine remains a powerful tool of self-reflection and a means of making an honest accounting of oneself. Now in its purest form, the Examine is a lengthy and arduous process. It requires no less than four weeks of intensive reflection, fasting, and prayer. It is by design a deeply unpleasant experience intended to, in Ignatius' words, reform what has been deformed by sin. I have to imagine that his broken leg was an influence here, as it had to be rebroken more than once, excess bone sawed off, among other excruciating pains that were necessary for healing. In describing the first week of the examined, Ignatius writes, I avoid all thoughts that bring me joy. I deprive myself of the brightness of light. I absolutely refrain from laughing. I do not fix my eyes on anyone. I wear hair shirts, ropes, or chains. I know I'm not doing a great job of selling this Ignatian examine, but fortunately there are simpler ways to conduct this practice, or at least an approximation of it. In modern times, recognizing that most folks don't have 30 days to spare and fewer still want to use their vacation time wearing chains and eating nothing but bread and water, the Jesuits have proposed an alternative, daily practice, that can still allow for some healthy introspection. Now, as it's usually practiced today, the Ignatian Examine has five steps to be rehearsed daily, usually in the evening. The first simply is to give thanks to God for all of the benefits one may receive from this practice. The second, recognizing our own propensity to minimize our errors, is to ask for God's grace and wisdom in identifying and acknowledging our sins. The third and most challenging phase of the examine is to move through the course of one's entire day, hour by hour, and to honestly interrogate ourselves about the places where we have strayed from God's will, the wrong we've done, the good we failed to do, missed opportunities, all the times that we have fallen short of God's desire for us. This is not intended to be masochistic or some kind of pity party, but rather an honest dialogue with ourselves mediated by God. The fourth stage is to ask for forgiveness, and the fifth, with God's help, to commit to living more fully tomorrow. Finally, the Lord's Prayer is recited, a humble request that God's will for us be done. Now, I suspect, even if We've never heard of the Ignatian Examine. Some of us conduct many of these steps already in a more informal fashion as we lay in bed at night. But without the strict form, as I can tell you from experience, this often leads to spiraling thoughts and restless sleep. Without the form, without the mediating presence of God in prayer, our thoughts turn in on themselves. They mutate into some variation of things that we'd wish we'd said or done witty comebacks that we ought to have employed in the moment, feelings of shame for having given in to any number of temptations. Without God's presence, there is no forgiveness for ourselves. It no longer is a civil conversation with oneself and with God, but rather a violent wrestling with ourselves that does not always end well. One can well imagine that Jacob took a careful inventory of all of his livestock and cattle before sending them across the Jabbok River. I'm sure he took an accounting of 
wives, children, servants, making sure that everyone was present and everything was prepared before his big meeting the next day with his brother Esau. As I said before, he hadn't seen Esau in 14 years, having swindled his brother out of his inheritance and fled the country. And he was anxious about meeting him again, afraid that Esau still might want to kill him for what he'd done. Now, the livestock and the cattle were a peace offering, but Jacob knew that it might not be enough. Stealing Esau's inheritance was an act of betrayal that he had yet to apologize for, a sin that had haunted him for years, something he tried desperately to escape and forget as he built a new life for himself in another land. He got married twice, had kids, worked on his career. He always kept a careful inventory of his wealth and his property. But Jacob hadn't taken an honest accounting of himself. Eventually, on the banks of the Jabbok River, Jacob's ghosts caught up with him. He spent that night alone, wrestling with something, with someone, until dawn. Wrestling with the accumulated guilt of 14 years. Wrestling with a sin that he had never been able to forgive himself for. Wrestling with himself, which turns out to be a painful process that leaves him damaged, limping along with a broken leg, just like Ignatius. It's funny how spiritual enlightenment often seems to accompany these moments of crisis. I'm reminded of a children's television show from way back when called Captain Hook and his Christian puppet pirates, in which the titular Captain Hook is played by a man who in real life found Jesus after losing an arm and a leg in a horrific motorcycle accident. He replaced them with a real hook and a real wooden leg, and he started this painfully awkward television show about Christian pirates who are also puppets who literally force idolaters and heretics to walk the plank. Did I mention the puppets? Self-reflection can be hard. But maybe spiritual epiphanies do not require you to lose an arm and a leg. They don't need to wait until you find yourself in a crisis. Maybe it would have been easier for Jacob if he had simply asked God, asked Esau, asked himself for forgiveness 14 years earlier, instead of trying to buy it now with a herd of cattle, instead of running from his sins until his guilt broke him. I confess that sometimes I feel a bit like Jacob. I think we all do, if we're being honest. We'd rather not face our demons if it can be helped. We'd rather not take an honest accounting of ourselves or an inventory of our sins. I have to say I admire Pastor Kendra for her proactive approach to spiritual reflection. I've seen photographs of these worksheets that she posts on Facebook, little exercises where she'll journal about her hopes and fears and human failings. And these are often nestled alongside a hot cup of tea, whimsical and homespun portraits of spiritual practice. I see these photographs usually while I'm lying sprawled on the couch, scrolling through my phone, my kids screaming at each other, and a dog chewing on my leg. Most days, all I want to do is escape for a little while, find a little bit of respite. But if I'm looking for sanctuary on Facebook, I'm probably looking in the wrong places. Maybe peace, real peace, comes from facing your problems instead of running away. It's been said that the unexamined life is not worth living. I'd argue that it is not even your life at all. It's something that you've put on autopilot, something that just goes through the motions, follows the proverbial GPS. And Lent is a time for something more. It's a time for understanding what drives us, 
for taking the time to be intentional about our choices, for taking charge of our own spiritual health, our own spiritual journey. And don't worry about packing any survival gear for the trip. The only thing you have to bring is yourself. Amen.